you're just getting which is always a good thing. You like to have things going smoothly on a Wednesday because it's Wealth Wellness Wednesday. Good morning, everyone. This is Carol Swift, a.k.a. Nani Boss, live with you. This does. And good morning, everyone. This is Janice, a.k.a. Wellness Diva 5.0. And we have our first guest um, on today from a little bit of a hiatus um with everything happening uh with my son but i want to assure everyone he's doing very very well so thank you all again for your for your messages and everything um we have the pleasure of welcoming to our two sisters podcast family attorney katherine burmeister and she is just amazing uh, what she has covered in her lifetime thus far um, amazes me. She's not only obviously an attorney and lives in Texas, she's also, um, you know, has owned her own business and actually started her business, uh, her opened her law firm, I believe it was back in 2018, all online before everything got kind of crazy in the world. And she's, <laughs> excuse me, also um, as a particular appreciation for cars. And I can't wait to get into that. So Catherine, thanks you, you so much for joining Carol, Sue, and I today, and welcome to the Two Sisters podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, We're wonderful. We're super excited. We are super excited. I, I actually have an attorney question. I don't know where I'm going to fit it in. but <laughs> <laughs> Well, why don't we start out with the attorney question? Right. Well, you know, obviously we, we know what's going on in the world and we always chat about everything that has to do with health and wellness mindset and what is going on in our outside, our outside world that actually does impact us. So obviously we've got a fierce uh, kind of fever pitch of parents and grandparents and stakeholders that are uh, in the midst of chatting and uh, attending school committee meetings and uh, trying to find out what is going on locally within their systems and, and mandates and masks and vaccinations and all that happy jazz. So my question is, because this would be uh, actually a couple uh, people I know said, oh my God, you have an attorney coming on. We've got to get this question answered. So the question is, as a citizen, obviously we have the right in certain scenarios uh, with the Freedom of Information Act to request from a records uh, officer certain documents. So the question is, when you're requesting all these documents and, and the language is going back and forth very fine, uh, there's cooperation on all ends. And at the last second or the last correspondent, correspondence through digital, meaning email, mm -hmm. you have uh, the records officer now CCing an attorney and also CCing members of the committees that you are trying to get this information, you know, public records about. A is that I'm assuming it has to be legal, but why would a records officer wait to kind of like the 12th hour to do that? What, what would be the advantage and or is it kosher? I don't know. <laughs> So first, let me full disclosure, I handle personal injury law and like doctors in school, we cover a little bit of everything, um, right. but we definitely specialize when we get out. So to the extent that I know about Freedom of Information Act, that's the federal level. A lot of states have their own state level, like in Georgia, where I am, actually, they have um, sunshine law that basically it's the same thing. It's just a state level. Right. So um, they're not required to bring those entities in or those people in. That's their job is to, re you know, to get the documents and return them to people that request them. Um, but I would imagine they bring them in at a certain point when they they've been trained, like if it's gotten to X level where people are asking about why documents that they need to bring in their legal people for that or certain entities. So I think it's just a protocol that they have um, okay. and putting everybody on notice, quite frankly. Um, you know, if it's something innocuous, maybe it's not that big of a deal or doesn't get to a certain level. They don't need to. But it seems like with these things escalating, just putting people on notice that they this could be coming down the pike, but they'll have to deal with it. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Cause I, like I said, the, the actual last response had to do with actually getting a tracking number for the package. Um, the, the, they, they're not quite completed. Apparently the full package of what they're sending, they sent partially by digital email. 
um, but then a package was sent out. So the person requesting was actually just trying to get the tracking number and they couldn't provide a tracking number, which I thought was a little odd as most people on something important like that, you would think you would want a record of receipt uh, knowing that it's going out, but that's when these other entities were now all of a sudden CC. So it was kind of a weird thing. It could have been as simple as that person didn't actually send it out. So the other people had the tracking number. I don't think it was right. anything right. like, you know, ulterior or anything like that. I think it was just, they didn't have it. <laughs> that's great. So that, that was my thing. Yeah, that's good. That was an easy solve. <laughs> that's good. So Catherine, um, I know that you are also an author and a speaker. And in fact, you wrote a book in 2020 entitled Overcoming Addi Addiction to the Status Quo. And you began um, speaking about uh, self-care business law and obviously you have a passion for helping others which is amazing um and you also have a particular passion for mental health self-improvement and emotional intelligence and i was wondering if you could just kind of um give us some background to why you wrote your book um and because i think that's really kind of an integral part with where you are not only in your personal life but in your business life Definitely. So uh, the quick and dirty version, um, I've wanted to be a lawyer since middle school. I always had this strong sense of just and unjust laws and standing up for that. Um, so I set myself on that path. I eventually came to be with a personal injury law firm that really was my dream job after I got my license. Uh, the partner was really good about teaching us and letting us do things, not just keeping us under his thumb. About a year and a half after I started there, he ended up committing suicide. He had been stealing from clients for eight years um, and he left notes like there was no doubt about it. Um, I tried uh, myself, the senior associate at that time and one paralegal tried to salvage the firm and keep it going for about a year after that. I was basically handling everything in the firm. Uh, the now named partner, you know, my former senior associate, he basically checked out mentally and physically. And I'm not downplaying the impact it had on him, but it had an impact on everybody. Um, and so from there, about a year after we started that venture, I hit my, what I call my rock bottom of my addiction to the status quo. And when I use the word addiction, I don't use it flippantly. I genuinely believe it is an addiction. And in fact, I think it leads to other addictions like alcoholism, drug use, um, you know, all kinds of, of, addictions. And I think it's really the, the entry addiction for lack of a better phrase, because the reason we do a lot of these other things is because we are trying to live up to other people's expectations or our own expectations. And that's what I mean when I talk about the status quo. So the idea that you should be a certain way, or you shouldn't be a certain way, or you're not enough, that's all the status quo talking to you, whether it's externally or internally. So I hit my rock bottom and I was very fortunate. I very quickly was able to start drawing lines in the sand and I, cause I knew all these things, right? Like a lot of things in life, we know what's better for us, right? We know we shouldn't be doing a certain thing. Um, but it's hard as hell to actually do it. Um, and because we're so afraid and you're afraid of the unknown, even if it's better for you. So I had got to the point where I wasn't afraid anymore. And really what I writing this book showed me was I realized I'd proven to myself that I was enough after having gone through all these things, I felt I was enough and it shouldn't have taken that. Right. And that's my biggest message from this book. It should not take you hitting a rock bottom in your life to start taking control, setting boundaries, um, taking care of yourself and living a happy life, which I believe is our purpose, regardless of what you believe, you know, emotionally or spiritually or religiously. I feel like our purpose here is to have a happy life and live a purposeful, meaningful life. And to do that, you have to be really in tune with who you are and what you mean to yourself. Um, external things aren't going to help you figure that out, right? Inanimate objects aren't going to help you figure that out. And obviously there's a threshold. We all need our basic needs met. But beyond that, the idea that we can live a better quality of life on our own terms shouldn't take us, you know, getting to a certain point or saying we have achieved this or we did that. It's in and of ourselves that we have to be happy. Um, and that happiness really comes from setting those boundaries and starting to dive into who you are as an individual. I, I absolutely love all of that because, you know, with what we share and what we do is always first and foremost has to be, you have to be authentically accountable to yourself. And I think 
while men experience some of that, I think women uh, in general, because they're, you know, usually the caregiver, uh, they, they may be that professional, that entrepreneur, uh, then that parent, and then also taking care of maybe elderly as they're, as they're getting older. So they're literally, you know, juggling a thousand different things and the self-care piece to most is I'll get to me later. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that project that I absolutely love to do, or I'll get back into cooking, which I love to do, or, you know, sewing or, you know, my fitness level or, you know, getting with, even with my girlfriends and you need that, you need that time to say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm good to no one if I'm not good and first to myself. And I think a lot of people have a hard time, you know, my interpretation is maybe because they think it's self selfish which of course we know it's not and like you said we shouldn't wait till that point where you are so down under uh that you're not only being slapped in the face with it but you like you're crawling yourself out of the hole it doesn't while it does for most get to that point sadly uh, but it doesn't have to Absolutely. And I mean, you brought up a good point. Like we do feel like it's a selfish concept. And I think because, especially as women, it's easy for us to say, we'll put ourselves last and take care of everything else. And that we need to prove something to ourselves or prove something to others. But it, I, it's a very simple analogy, but the idea of being on a plane and putting your oxygen mask on first before you put it on somebody else, that's it. That's it hands down. And I think it's easy with our mental health to, put it to the side because it's not as easy to see as a broken bone or, you know, things like that. So, but really you have to, because again, it's, it, it can be your choice now, or it's going to be forced on you later. Um, so why not be proactive about it and live a better version of yourself? Because again, you don't want to get to the end of your life saying, wow, I really wish I did fill in the blank. And usually for people, it's spent more time with my family, enjoying relationships, experiences. Um, yeah, it's just life's too short. No matter what you believe, we know what we have now. Um, and even then we don't know how long we have. So what a, what a tragedy to live your entire life, you know, living up to other people's expectations or expectations that you, you know, outrageously put on yourself to get to the end of it and go, why, what does it really matter? I mean, seriously, ask yourself, if you knew that you were not going to be here tomorrow, next week, what would you do? And I understand we all have basic things that we have to cover, right? We've got to pay the bills, but there's a happy medium. It's not always going to be rainbows and kittens. I wish it was, but the reality is you can choose to embrace adversity or encounter challenges in a healthy way that allows you to move through life that in a way that's purposeful and pleasant. I love that. I love that in so many different respects. And also, I think too, a lot of times when we're in the pursuit of that, happiness or maybe that goal whatever it may be that um sometimes i think we put maybe too much emphasis on well when i get to that point i'll be happy or when i can afford to do this i'll be happy so why not expend that energy not until you wait for something but the journey maybe to get there or to say for a special event or something like that and I talked to a lot of people about this. So I am not downplaying the fact that money makes things easier, right? And again, we have basic needs that need to be met. So I'm talking from a place of privilege in that regard. What I am saying though, is money in and of itself doesn't make you happy. What you can do with those things is what makes you happy. And to me, happiness is living the best version of yourself, whatever that is. And it's different for everyone. But having the money to go on trips or have experiences is great, but you can simply go to a local park with your kids and take a hike in the woods. You don't have to fly out to California and go to Mere Woods like I do because I love to do it to enjoy the same concept, which is spending time with those that you care about in nature, right? Um, so yeah, I think people get so focused on money and the idea of we need to get to the next thing to do the next big purchase. And I think it's a shift generationally too. Um, my generation, I feel like is really focused on living and having experiences as opposed to material possessions. Because I've seen a lot of um, estate sales recently and read news articles about it where people in my parents' generation are have all these things that their kids don't want. It's just like, yeah. where, where am I going to, I mean, even though I love antiques, like, where am I going to put it? You know, 
I can't keep everything. And the idea of investing in those things just to have them just doesn't translate anymore. Um, and I don't think it's just generationally. I think it's, it's just a, it's, economically things that have changed, but we can all at any generational level embrace the idea that we can't take these things with us. Right. We can have these life experiences that are meaningful because when you look back, you're going to remember the times that you did, you know, the adventure with your family or spent the extra night with your husband or spouse or whatever, hanging out. Um, you're not going to remember the, you know, dining room set that you bought uh, that you really like. So it's, it's hard to step away from, but I'm a recovering box checker myself. So <laughs> let me tell you, even checking off all those boxes, it, you, it, stri it strikes you that you're not happy checking off all those boxes. Like you expect this epiphany to happen, right? Like I'm happy. I've done everything I was supposed to do. And it's just not the case because happiness in and of itself is a spectrum, right? And then it's an ongoing process. It's life. But being happy with yourself and not because of what you do or what you've accomplished or what you bought is going to be what real happiness leads to, which is the best version of yourself. That is true. And I've got like boxes and boxes and and where we uh, kind of cleaned house like you were talking about just the things that you hold on to and you know when you said that I was cracking up because uh our our grandparents uh and our and our mom had this thing about dishes and I always love dishes so I have the bulk of them and now I'm trying to like does anybody want these flipping dishes like what am I going to do with them and you know, your generation, that is very true. Cause I, I, I've talked to so many in your age group and they're like, yeah, we don't, we, we just don't use China anymore. We don't use like, and I'm like, oh my Lord, what am I going to do with this crap? And <laughs> you, wonder, you know, as you're going through it. So I've kind of made a mental note to myself because for me, even though your generation looks at those things differently, I look them as part of the memory. Um, so, you know, that, that China is associated with, you know, that was always used at, you know, Christmas time or Easter time or whatever, but I realized that I can't hold on to all of them. So what I'm doing is, especially if it's a, like, you know, an eight piece or a 10 piece or, or, or even an odd piece is I'm keeping one place setting, uh, of each and then just kind of letting it go to a consignment shop or whatever. So I still have that memory because it does hold a special place and then only just keeping what I specifically want. And that's hard to do because you almost feel like, you know, on a bigger scale that you're letting the generations before you down because A, maybe you're not cherishing them the same way that they did. Why did they cherish them? I mean, back in the day, they, only, they had that one set of China. They have that one set of whatever, but you know, as the generations keep going down, the, 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 it multiplies. So I've got, I can't even tell you how many boxes and I did get rid of quite a few and I still have them. And you know, my husband and I were like, we, we can't take this crap. And you know, I, I talked to, we had a hard conversation about what we wanted to keep. And we made the decision that like, it's either us cleaning it out or when we're gone, do we want to put that burden on the next generation to clean it out? And we don't. So we've really tried to scale back on things and, you know, give them to somebody else that, you know, might find pleasure in them or cherish them or use them. And that in itself feels good, and it, it, but it, it is hard. And when you look at it from a not so much material thing, but, but an emotional thing on how we always do that. Like how many times do you look in your, your closet and you say, Oh, I'm holding onto those pair of jeans until I fit into them again. So you're reaching out for a, what you interpret a smaller version is going to be a happier version. And I tell people now cut the label out. If, if the size bothers you cut the, but you really like them, cut the label out and wear whatever you makes you feel comfortable and if it doesn't make you feel comfortable get rid of it donate it there's so many people that are in need so it is a hard concept when you look at it from a more uh, emotional set don't you think jim oh yes because i think well you know people who know where i live on the little circle i mean you know my husband's been in this house his entire life and i just have this little sliver of room in one particular area of the house and it's all over the place. So, you know, we were having this discussion, um, I don't know, a couple of days ago, um, you know, maybe traveling the world or uh, I should say the United States in a camper. Well, guess what? 
all the crap in this house is not going to fit in a camper. So mm -hmm. time to start purging. But um, I want to kind of switch um, uh, the conversation a little bit. And I'm really interested to hear about your appreciation for cars um, and Formula One racing, because I find that so interesting. I'm kind of, yeah, I, I have really a wide variety of interests. Um, first, I want to say, Carol Sue, I love that idea of, um, again, finding a happy medium, taking one piece and keeping it for, you know, memorial purposes. Again, we always fall into this false dichotomy. I'm guilty of it too. Either it's all or nothing. And no, I love that idea. And I think as, you know, even my generation can appreciate that. That's why I hold on to a lot of pieces of my house is because they're from my family ahead of me and I like them. So right. I love that idea. Um, yeah, with regards to cars, I don't, I was always hanging out with car clubs when I was a teenager and I look back on my parents. I mean, I was a good kid, but I think about them letting me go out and hang out with these older guys in car clubs. I'm like, why the hell did they let me do that? And I mean, I, again, I didn't get in trouble, but thinking if I had a kid, I'd be like, ah, oh, no. But I hung out with car clubs growing up. And so I just really got interested in them. And then my husband, is really into cars and he introduced me to formula one a couple of years ago um actually the drive to survive um is on i think it's netflix and it basically is the reality show i mean it's not scripted at all of what happens in formula one you've got 20 of the best drivers in the world with a lot of ego and a lot of money in that sport so naturally i think in and of itself it's going to create that drama so I just got fascinated by it and I have a whole new appreciation for what they're doing, the technical aspects that go into it, um, the quality of these drivers. And then in particular, the seven time world champion, Lewis Hamilton, he, uh, he's one of the few uh, individuals of color in the sport period um, in the world, let alone, you know, one of the drivers that's uh, of color. So it's really interesting to watch that. And then also him use his platform when I think so now it's becoming more common, but I think a lot of professional athletes are hesitant to still speak out and use their platform um, to, for change, social and um, societal change, but he really does that. So that's why I'm interested as well, but it's, it's really fun to watch. And there just is a lot of drama in it too. <laughs> I'm sure there is. And, you know, even that, even that subject, I mean, when you think about it, that's controversial because there are some people that we just love the sport. We want to be involved with the sport. We want to watch the, the sport. Um, we don't want the sport used as a platform. So that in itself is, is takes a lot of courage and, uh, you know, kudos to anyone that does that because you, you, there is a lot of, sometimes there is some fallback with that. You know, if it goes kind of gets to a certain level, and I do believe that people should use their platform uh, in a healthy way. Uh, and, you know, and if, and if they're doing it in, in such a way that is still not kind of taking over or shadowing what they're doing, I think I, I'm all for that. I think for most Americans though, I think because there's so much intertwined with politics and or uh, social injustices or whatever that are so intertwined into just that downtime to relax that sport. I think that's for a lot of people, it, it's a struggle, it's a balance. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, that's a personal, obviously personal opinion about how we look at things, but I also think generally, even if, if even if these views that he's espousing, I didn't agree with, I still feel like you've gotten to that point in your career and you have that notoriety. You know, I mean, I can't fault anybody for speaking up for what they believe in. Um, and it's they're still racing. You know, they're still out there having fun. If you don't want to follow them on the social media, that's totally fine. Um, right. But yeah, there's plenty, plenty of sport to watch without, you know, any of the personal opinions. But there are very few Americans and, you know, I don't think any of the current drivers are Americans. So all of these people are from all around the world, which makes it a whole other interesting issue because they go to different countries in you know, Middle East and Asia and things like that and, you know, make certain statements and I think that's where there it gets a little dicey because some of these cultures definitely are not on the level that we are in terms of progressiveness maybe arguably so right. it's uh it's interesting yeah for yeah. sure so do, you, so do you think you're uh do you, do you have that need to uh the need to drive fast or to I do actually uh I just got back so the reference to California and hiking was was close because I just got back from California after over a year of not traveling and now we're kind of going back to that place of not going out anymore but um we went and rented a Porsche my husband and I and he's like I said big car guy so he we went out in Petaluma which is very much farm country out in California and drove, um, and, cause you can see forever. Um, 
And I actually convinced him to let me drive it. Not because he was scared, but it was his deal. Right. Right. Um, But yeah, I had a blast and we have tracks around here that I can't wait to get into. It's actually car, a higher level karting, like small race cars, but bigger carts. Um, And I'm really excited to do it. It's just hotter than hell in Georgia. It's supposed to feel like 103 today. So um, I'm going to wait till it gets a little bit colder (laughs) to go out there and do that. But yeah, I love driving fast. Um, thankfully, knock on wood, I haven't gotten in trouble for it, but yeah, I do. Well, well, I'm sure you know some um, good lawyers that might be able to represent you in there. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> That's true. Um, Catherine, I also know that you have obviously a love for for animals. In fact, you are involved with the um, Animal Legal Defense Fund, which is a nonprofit um, organization whose mission it is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system, which I think is just uh, so unbelievable because animals are, our pets are not just animals, they are members of our family. So how many pets um, do you have? And just tell us a little bit more about that nonprofit organization. Yeah, so I currently have four cats and one dog. I lost um, my dog of 13 years last fall and my oldest cat of 13 years um, within two months of each other last fall. Um, So I have a new puppy. He's actually up in his crate because he would let me know everything that's going on outside. But um, yeah, they're my they're my babies and I don't have kids. I'm not planning on having kids, but um, I just I've always, like I said, had a strong sense of just and unjust and have been really drawn to helping those that were less fortunate or uh, didn't have a voice. So giving a voice to animals is really important to me, just as much as it's important in my personal injury practice, which gives a voice to people that are going up against insurance companies. So uh, working with Animal Legal Defense Fund has been really fascinating because the that's really what it fascinates me about the law is using the law to advocate whatever it is, just the idea of using it in a, a non-traditional sense, because how many people go into the law and think, oh, we're going to advocate for animals. So it's, they do everything from wildlife protection to, um, you know, entertainment animals, to domestic animals, to animals um, for farming, things like that. And most recently, uh, there's been a law that's been passed where California is not going to be importing any pork that has been raised in certain size pens. Um, so any of the states that are not going to be switching over to a larger size are not going to be allowed to export their, you know, their meat to California. So, and I know people have mixed feelings, right? I'm not, not everybody's going to be a vegetarian. Not everybody's going to care about farm animals. Um, I think we can all agree though, that people, animals, and, you know, things should not suffer needlessly. Um, and to the extent that it makes a better quality of life, um, arguably for the time that they're here. You know, we don't, I don't think it's a situation where people are starving if they don't get their bacon every Saturday morning. So if that's the case, clearly there's, there's bigger issue, but it's just because we want to have an except inexpensive luxuries. I don't have a problem with people trying to advance the welfare through economic terms. Um, But, you know, they even do the domestic animals and the wildlife. So it's really important to be able to use those laws to protect, uh, again, those that don't have a voice, which is really important to me as well. I I think that's um, like just so amazing and I'm reading your bio as I'm kind of like kind of glancing at it over in fact you did your first rescue your first animal rescue when you were in the sixth grade can you talk about that (laughs) (laughs) I'm parents really appreciated that yeah, I, uh, I scale. So you know how you have the generators outside of schools and they have like an eight foot fence. It's higher than six foot, I think, or maybe I was just really small. So it felt like it's bigger, but, um, I ended up scaling that fence to go rescue a kitten and my associate or assistant principal came out. I was like, what do you think you're doing? I was like, clearly I'm rescuing the cat. Like, why was this concept, you know, not accepted by everyone? So my dad works midnights or worked midnights at the time. And so I definitely rescued the kitten, called him crying. And my dad came down and 
we adopted this cat. This is our first cat. We'd always had dogs up until this point. And so that was my first rescue. And from there, it's just now they know. I mean, they send the message out across the country that, you know, here's this sucker that will help you and take you in because they all find me. I mean, it's a joke almost. Whenever we go places, the animals that will come up and find me. So I don't take all of them home, obviously, but, um, you know, I at least can get them into the right place, hopefully to, to get them in a good home. Well, that's awesome. And, you know, that is so true with, you know, pets add so much value to uh, a family, a person, uh, to elderly, um, you know, then you have the, the service pets that are really helping our uh, brave men and women that need that assistance, somebody that has, you know, any kind of uh, mental issues, they're there for them, they provide love, security, and I think that's amazing. And Janice, you really said it. I mean, it's, they are more than just animals. Um, and I think we all collectively as a society accept that. And um, it's unfortunate that in the law, they're not treated as that. They're still very much seen as property and mm -hmm. inanimate property, but it's slowly changing. Um, criminal laws have definitely advanced more than civil laws. So if somebody, um, you know, hurts your animal, they can get prosecuted criminally, but you can't go after them really civilly for much other than the value of the pet. Well, the value is calculated based on what you paid for the pet, which is often not much, especially if you do, you know, adoption or things like that. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the impact that they have on our lives and to think that that's, you know, somehow in a vacuum and doesn't have a value. I can't remember what, how many billions of dollars are spent on the animal care industry for companion animals every year. So obviously a lot of people feel the same way. Absolutely. And there's also so many, uh, like pet hotels now. Uh, I, I see them popping up all over the place and everyone, you know, the, the concept years ago was a little odd, but I thought, well, that was a business to get into because people do value where, you know, if they're going away, they want to make sure that their, their pet is taken care of. Uh, they want them to be safe. They want to make sure that they're being fed and cleaned and taken care of. And uh, I think it's, I think it's amazing. And, and sometimes it does take somebody a little bit more, uh, special in the sense that just has that, that inner thing with, with pets to kind of do that. But I think, like you said, most everyone could agree they, they add enjoyment, they impact, and they're family members. I mean, frequently when you chat with somebody, especially if they've lost a reason, refer to them as their pets, like their family member. And that's, yeah. we have two cats and as much as, you know, one is Jerry Seinfeld, the other one is Tate. They definitely have two different personalities. One lives to eat and the other one lives, uh, eats to live. And, but they do see their different personalities and what, you know, joy they add or even, you know, kind of when they're going after each other, you just, you kind of wonder what are they thinking? So uh, yeah, they do add a lot of joy and they are part of the family. And I think that's awesome that you're doing that and, uh, more people need to do that. And I see one. Yes, me. this is Lily. Um, we, we get really creative. We come up with background stories for all of our animals. So, but yeah, she uh, is one of two, a brother and a sister pair were my last adoptions and my husband gave them. I'd already adopted them. I was trying to find them a home or you know, rescued them. I was trying to find a home. They were a wedding present. So her and her brother are a wedding <laughs> present. <laughs> What a great wedding present. I know. And I did like the ugly cry and, you know, everything. So it was like best present ever. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Um, in closing, I know that you are a voracious uh, reader and Carol Sue and I um, love to read. And I set myself a goal to read, read 10 um, like personal development books Um by September 1st. And today I will be finishing my ninth book. So I'm just curious, like what, what are you currently reading? What is currently on your nightstand? Oh God, I have a stack. Are you one of those people? There's actually a term for it. <laughs> I don't know why, but I buy the book and I end up reading it eventually, but there's still like a stack, right? That I haven't finished. Um, Right now, to be honest, I'm not reading any self-improvement books at the moment. Um, I've been reading more nature-based books, uh, but I will say that any book by Brene Brown, it, I'm a fan of. So anybody who has not read Brene Brown's work, literally you could pick up any one of her books and be able to relate. She just has a way of, she's brilliant, but she has a way of making it so relatable at the same time, but it's not too warm and fuzzy for people that maybe wanted a little more scientific. So it's very much a happy medium. And uh, she talks to you 
and you know, where you are because she's been there. And I think that's why it's so relatable. So anything by Bren- Brene Brown is something I'm going to approve of. So yeah. a curio- another cu- curiosity question. How many books would you say are lying around your house right now? Too many. Um, <laughs> gosh, I'd say at least 80. I'm not including my husband's like Star, not Star Trek, Star Wars, um, you know, sagas that we keep holding on to. I'm like, you've read them, let them go. You know, it's not like you're going back to reference them, right? Um, yeah, I have a number of them. Um, even like uh, Michelle Obama, um, what's the title of it? I'm blanking. Uh, her book that she wrote not too long ago. I have that. I've been meaning to read it. I just haven't read it yet. So um, yeah, I, I think it's partly because now too, especially I have so many other things going on that I always make time during my day to mentally decompress. So literally not doing anything and just kind of sitting either with my thoughts or, you know, playing a game on my phone. And I know like we're always on our phones, but I'm really not because I'm doing so many other things during the day. So it's nice to just mentally check out. And even though reading can be really enjoyable and take you to another place in fictional sense, um, a lot of what I read is not fiction. So that's probably why I uh, end up taking a little bit more of a break from some of the reading that I do. That's wow. awesome. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, Catherine, we can't thank you enough for um, taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Um, And we hope that you certainly will consider coming back to visit with us again soon. Um, So thank you so much. And I believe at the beginning, I said you were from Texas. I don't know why I said that. That's okay. I want to clarify, you are from Georgia. So people in Georgia, um, if you have a personal injury matter, um, please contact Catherine. And on that note, we all hope you have an amazing Wealth Wellness Wednesday. My name is Janice, aka Wellness Diva 5.0. And I am with two... So this is Carol Sir, aka Nani Boss. We are super excited because Wealth Wellness Wednesday kind of, you know, just includes so many great things, but we will be chatting tomorrow on what is going on with Trending Thursday. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much for uh, adding so much value, Catherine, to our day. And you talked about a gamut of different things. So we hope you all reach out to her if you need any help with animals, sports cars, attorneys. <laughs> She's got a whole gamut of things going on. You guys have a great day. We'll chat tomorrow. Bye, everyone.